access to information and protect the fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and agreements. These are freedoms that are among the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDG, particularly SDG number 16, or peace, justice, and strong institutions. The exercise also aims to develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels. Again, this is another target of SDG 16. Ladies and gentlemen, we have four experts with us this afternoon, and I will introduce them to you one after the other so that the experts can speak sequentially without further uh, interruption. Today's webinar brings together experts from different sectors who will share their views and some propositions by which Philippine society could pursue SDG 16 and exercise people's freedom of choice despite a pandemic. Keywords today, sustainable goals, freedom of choice, the right to vote, pandemic. Amongst us today, we are honored to have the following personalities. First, an expert from international idea, Mr. Antonio Espinele. Uh, Antonio, welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar. He is Senior Advisor for Electoral Processes, International Ideas, Asia and Pacific Regional Program. Mr. Espinelli's previous work includes primarily the management of large scale electoral assistance projects in transitional political and democratic settings for numerous organizations such as the United Nations, the IFES or the International Foundation for Electoral System and the European Commission. He was part of a dynamic team that conceptualized innovative and groundbreaking electoral policies and supporting sustainable electoral assistance and effective electoral management forward worldwide. In 2011, he authored the IFES publication, Strategic Planning for Effective Electoral Management, and which led him to assist numerous electoral management bodies worldwide in strategic and operational planning efforts. Our second expert is a graduate of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history, cum laude, and obtained her Bachelor of Laws from the UP College of Law, served as Vice President for Legal of the RSB Group of Companies from 2000 to 2010. She was also voted mayor of La Carlota City in Negros Occidental for six years and from 2016 has been serving as representative in the House of Representatives. She currently serves as the chair of the Committee on Suffrage in the Philippine House of Representatives. We await the, uh, the joining um, in this webinar, the Honorable Juliet Marie Ferrer. Our third expert began his career in public service as executive assistant to the former court administrator, Justice Alfredo Benipayo. He joined the Commission on Elections as consultant to former Commissioner Resurrection Bora, where he worked on modernization for the automated counting and canvassing project. He is currently Director of Education and Information, a very crucial uh, department of the Commission on Elections, when he strengthened Comelec's own online presence with several highly counteractive websites. Since 2006, he was designated the Comelec spokesperson. Uh, we welcome to this webinar, Director James Arthur Jimenez. Thank you very much, Director Jimenez, for joining us. And last but not least, 
there is with us an experienced leader, manager, and consultant in government and non-government organizations with long years of experience in strategic planning and management, training, organizing, financing, resource mobilization, innovative programming and networking in healthcare and rural development and local governance. He was consultant to a number of agencies, including the Department of Health, Field Health, Population Commission, the World Bank, USA, GTZ, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, Ford Foundation, and some of the local government units. He served as mayor of Irusin Sorsogon, where he implemented award-winning programs in healthcare, education, peace building, sustainable development and environment. And he served as chief of the Irusin District Hospital, awarded one of the 10 outstanding young Filipinos in 1995, most outstanding physician in 1996, and Conrad Adenauer Local Government Award in 1997. He received his Master in Public Administration from the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government and his medical degree from the University of the Philippines. He will join us a few minutes later, and I wish to thank and to welcome Dr. Eddie Dorotan. Our experts will share with us different narratives, perspectives, propositions on how Filipinos may be students of international electoral experiences where citizens battled and triumphed over a COVID-19 pandemic. And we will also learn, perhaps from our speakers, how resilient the coming national election could ensure that there would be safe and participatory 22 national elections. For our procedures, our expert will be given 15 minutes to speak, one after the other, and a final question and answer moment will follow after all experts have spoken. The experts' presentations will be screen shared by the webinar's organizers. Please direct your questions to the Q&A box, which you, which you can find at the bottom of your monitor. By the way, we have right now 110 registrants, and we will try our best to respond to all questions raised. Please make your questions brief and straight to the point and address it to whoever probably you'd like to direct your question to. We also request everyone to please answer our brief survey, which the organizers will flash on the screen later on. And uh, again, I'd like to welcome all of you. I'm Dr. Edna Ko, Director of the UPC FAL Philippines. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to hand over the microphone and the screen to our first expert, Antonio Espinelli. Antonio, you have the floor now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. you're here. Thank you, Dr. Edna. And um, I would like to start by extending International Idea uh, sincere appreciation to UP CIFAL Philippines and the Ateneo School of Government for the opportunity that we are having now today to cooperate by organizing the, this uh, discussion. In short, I will provide an overview of um, the experiences resulting from elections that have been conducted so far under the COVID-19 pandemic and analyzing uh, their management holistically and extracting um, key lessons to be considered for elections to come. So I will be, we, we, we will be keeping an eye on the past and an eye, an eye on the future. So uh, nine months have passed uh, already since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. And this has proven not only to be a health and economic crisis, but also a crisis of governance. And by no surprise, elections were an immediate casualty of this pandemic. 
And when held in uh, so-called normal conditions, uh, elections uh, are harmless exercises, but when instead uh, they must take place under a pandemic, they pose uh, serious uh, threats to individual and public health. And these threats uh, stem from the fact that uh, across the world, present time elections are still uh, predominantly conducted through uh, traditional in-person voting methods. Next slide, please. By uh, traditional voting methods, I refer to the method of voting in person at an assigned polling station in the constituency of registration and on election day. So when examining more in depth uh, this uh, traditional uh, voting method, we can see that the threats uh, to public health are presented by the three main dimensions around which this method uh, revolves physical dimension, because this method requires the physical attendance and the personal uh, uh, interaction of all those participating in the voting process, voters, poll workers, party and candidate representatives and election observers alike. It has a special dimension because traditional voting unfolds through administrative, uh, procedural, operational processes that are happening at a specific uh, location, the polling station. And finally, a temporal dimension, traditional voting methods are bound to occur and to conclude during a prescribed and limited time on election day. And so in a pandemic, these uh, uh, normally harmless uh, dimensions instead pose health risks because they require the entire electorate of a nation to physically converge over one single day in confined and crowded spaces where maintaining a safe uh, distance from others and observing health protocols may be difficult, if not impossible. So the health uh, and uh, uh, safety risks presented by traditional voting made very quickly a new and pressing demand on the management uh, of an on election uh, in the context of, of a pandemic particularly in countries that didn't have voting methods that were alternative to traditional voting uh, in polling stations already in place when they, they were hit uh, by the pandemic. So in a short time, the pandemic uh, challenged uh, consolidated standards uh, uh, over years, over decades for the conduct of democratic elections and rapidly transforming not only the way in which elections are planned, organized and implemented, but also how uh, they, uh, their integrity has been until now uh, conventionally assessed. So uh, next slide, please. At the time of the uh, initial outbreak, uh, no prior experience existed on how elections could be managed under such unprecedented circumstances. At the time, no one knew as to whether holding an election under a pandemic was a feasible task at all, what mitigating me measures could be devised and deployed to reduce the, risk, the, the risks uh, posed to public health, and how effective these measures uh, would actually be, and whether to which, uh, to which extent restrictions to be inevitably imposed on the electoral process would limit its transparency, accessibility, inclusiveness and integrity. And finally, how to ensure uh, uh, rates of voter participation that could guarantee a, le a legitimate election outcome and mostly would, uh, would guarantee uh, representative institutions. Next slide, please. So in the past months uh, with more assumptions than fact and more unknowns than uh, certainties, Several countries uh, confronted the pressing dilemma as to whether to hold or to postpone uh, the scheduled elections. Consequently, the initial period of the pandemic was uh, dominated by postponed elections. Several countries, however, opted to venture into this uncharted territory, holding uh, their uh, elections under such uh, challenges and uncertainties. They confronted uh, an immediate dual challenge. Not only they had to minimize health risk for voters, but also they had to reassure them that safe uh, voting conditions would be guaranteed 
uh, and convince them that they will be, they will be guaranteed so that their uh, undeterred uh, participation uh, would ensue. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the various, um, various elections conducted so far have offered and also continue to offer today much to learn. This important experience experiences have uh, inspired and guided other countries that uh, had to proceed and still have to proceed with their scheduled elections under the pandemic. So past elections provided to the world, the world uh, with an understanding of what conditions, measures, equipment and behaviors have to be in place to deliver a safe, uh, uh, technically sound and participatory elections under the pandemic and how effective uh, these uh, conditions, measure and equipment and behaviors would be. So the body of knowledge and the first hand experience that um, were acquired through these elections have set uh, a model and practices and benchmarks to follow. And these were, were not existing uh, just a few months ago. Past, um, elections have also helped uh, electoral management bodies or EMBs, as we call them, to prepare by learning from the experience of their peers, bro both from their successes and failures, understand the importance of the adapting their electoral frameworks and systems to respond to future emergencies, but also to appreciate the importance of building resilience in the management of elections. This past uh, experience has paid the way for other elections to be held contributing also to a shift in the initial trend to postpone elections that characterized the first months of the pandemic. In fact, today we can see a clear new tendency globally towards holding uh, elections rather than postponing them, even if uh, still under the strict uh, uh, health and safety measures. And uh, as these measures have become uh, more effective and consequently uh, more trusted, we can see also another tendency some elections held under the pandemic uh, under the pandemic have experienced uh, higher turnout rates than previous election cycles. So what can we learn from elections held until now? And uh, what do we know now that we didn't know a few months ago? Next slide, please. Well, first we know that the outbreak of a pandemic must be at contained levels by the time the election has been uh, scheduled. In fact, it would be unthinkable to consider holding it when uh, the infection is at its peak and uh, when national or partial uh, lockdowns and other restrictions of movements and on public uh, gatherings are imposed. We also know that to respond to the pressures imposed by the pandemic, an electoral framework has to be solid, but also responsive and adaptive at the same time so that it can allow necessary legislative, regulatory, and the procedural amendments while still protecting the integrity of the electoral process and public trust in it. And also while also providing the uh, electoral management body, the MB, with a clear mandate, with independent decision-making, and mostly with agility of action. We have also learned the importance of having well-established uh, and uh, well-established and, uh, and uh, experienced EMB in place, an EMB that is broadly trusted and respected for its proven capacity to ensure safe, efficient, and timely elections. We have also seen uh, how robust uh, electoral planning and risk management systems enable EMBs to be better prepare uh, to mitigate and to withstand potential risks and resolve them effectively and mostly preemptively. Now we also know that in a crisis, election costs multiply. So the timely availability of adequate means and resources is key to address uh, such challenges. We also see now strong public communication uh, strategy by the MB combined with stakeholder engagement and deliberation has allowed to deliver transparent, uh, safe and participatory and, and trusted elections. We have learned also that uh, proper and responsible behaviors uh, by the citizenry and their mostly compliance uh, to the rule with the rules is required and that the ability to guarantee 
safe voting conditions can incentivize their participation instead of deterring it. We have also seen how uh, bitter partisan uh, divisions expose voters and poll workers to serious safety risks and how a conducive political environment that allows political parties to put uh, aside ideological difference in compromise and cooperate while still competing in the election is an element conducive to uh, safe participatory and mostly to unchallenged elections. Next slides, please. We have also learned the importance of uh, interagency cooperation, consultation and coordination between the EMB, the various ministries, their departments, specialized uh, agencies, particularly those protecting public health. And we have seen how this allows these actors to join forces to effectively fight uh, the pandemic. We have seen how countries with uh, alternative voting methods already in place could uh, flexibly adapt them and scale them up to address uh, the sudden emergency. Extens extensively tested and previously used, these uh, methods had not, uh, they didn't have to be devised anew or implemented under time pressure with numerous unknowns. We have also uh, learned um, that uh, there is no need for a new untested, uh, overly technological and overly expensive uh, unsustainable solutions. We have seen, for example, that our early voting by extending the long uh, practice and trusted tradi traditional polling station voting method I was referring uh, before was a simple and effective solution to help the using the numbers of voting gathering at the polling station on uh, election day by spreading their uh, attendance over multiple days. Lastly, COVID-19 has demonstrated the, the need to provide different voting methods in alternative to traditional in-person voting, which is too strictly compelling voters to physically attend one and one only polling station over one and one only day. Next slide, please. Uh, elections conducted so far under the pandemic have demonstrated how alternative voting methods constitu constitute a valid measure offering voters, voters not only safer, but also more convenient manners to cast a ballot, either uh, uh, allowing them to vote in, per in person, but uh, during an, early, a an earlier and longer period of time than, than on a single day with fewer people, but also with fewer possibilities of getting infected and removing the temporal threat, or uh, vote absentee away uh, from polling stations uh, from a safer location, removing all threats, physical, spatial, and temporal. So um, by forcing uh, established voting method, methods and practices out of their prolonged uh, stillness, the pandemic is pressuring such methods and practices uh, to evolve. Through the course um, of history, as democracy uh, gradually became more and more inclusive, participatory and representative, voting methods had constantly to respond and adapt to meet the specific demands on new social, political, economic, and demographic realities coming to the fore. However, after uh, several centuries of evolving voting practices, present time elections uh, remain by and large statically and, and conventionally uh, centered on traditional in-person voting methods grounded at the polling stations. These methods firmly, still firmly anchored on physical, spatial and temporal requirements appear uh, no longer capable to meet uh, today's changing needs such as those having to respond to sudden emergencies or having to meet uh, increased uh, voter uh, mobility. Often, traditional voting is the only available uh, method uh, offered to vote, excluding from the electoral franchise those unable to meet for any reason any of these three requirements. So while uh, some countries do uh, currently provide some alternative voting methods, for the most, they are still reserved to a privileged few government police, military personnel, or voters abroad. In closing, what are the main legacies stemming from elections that have been conducted under the pandemic? Next slide, please. 
One main legacy is that to have revealed a, a disjuncture between the dynamic evolution through the passage of time and through crises like COVID of electoral and franchise need, and instead the stillness uh, of traditional voting methods, which appear to be lagging and slow in adapting to the, today's rapidly evolving emergency and needs in an increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, globalized world. Next. Uh, another uh, legacy is that to have revealed not only the limitation in the efforts of bringing voters to the ballot box, but even more the need for bolder efforts in also bringing the ballot box to the voters. Next. So uh, while recognizing that the further voting moves, moves away from the control environment of the polling station, the greater the risks that alternative voting methods pose to election integrity. Recognizing that alternative voting methods require security and integrity measures to be bolsters, to be bolstered, to detect and deter uh, greater chances for irregularities and fraud. And that such methods are costly. They need to be introduced, used, and sustained over time. That they need uh, political consensus and public trust that are difficult to obtain and maintain. And while recognizing that such method uh, required uh, adequate legal frameworks, infrastructures, and capacities. Next, we also uh, need to acknowledge the opportunity the pandemic uh, is presenting to rethink electoral accessibility. While not uh, all countries have the infrastructure, the means, the resources, the capability, or even the desire to introduce, manage, and maintain alternative voting methods, yet through political will, through appropriate and sustainable solutions uh, drawn from own experience, but also from that of others, electoral frameworks can be gradually strengthened and improved for elections to become not only safer, but also more uh, convenient and com inclusive. In addition to forcing us uh, uh, to taking stock, stock of multiple uh, challenges and restrictions, the pandemic has also exposed uh, the long and overdue realization that to further strengthen and safeguard our uh, democracies, elections should become uh, truly inclusive, participatory and representative processes. Thank you for the attention and I look forward to the other presentations. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. That was really uh, a very uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, for those of us who have a number of questions addressed to Antonio, please uh, uh, write this, write your questions at the Q&A box. And uh, later on, we will address uh, uh, your questions. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to hand over now the microphone, the floor, to our second expert. And uh, she's uh, here with us now. She has uh, just joined us. I am giving the floor to the uh, Honorable Congresswoman uh, Juliet Marie Ferrer, who is chairing the House Committee on Suffrage. Uh, Honorable Kong, you have now the floor. Thank you. Um, a very good afternoon to all of you from the House of Representatives. Um, can you hear me? Dr. Yes, Kong? yes, yes. Uh, very, uh, very well. And your very pretty photo as well on the screen. Thank you. Um, a very good afternoon to all of you from the House of Representatives Committee on Suffrage and Electoral Reforms. I would like to thank um, UP Cephal and the Ateneo School of Government for inviting me. I will be speaking on behalf of the House of Representatives today, so I will um, limit um, this is this um, to the measures that are, are before the House of Representatives. As chair of the committee of the uh, of suffrage and electoral reforms for the 18th Congress, I am very happy to report that yesterday we approved the substitute bill on the amendments of the Voters Registration Act. We are preparing right now the committee report 
so that it will be calendared by the Committee of Rules for plenary debates the soonest possible time. The substitute bill institutionalizes voter registration online with the intent of easing the influx of applicants in the offices of the Commission on Elections nationwide, not only due to this global health crisis, but as a permanent mode of applying to register in order to vote in the years to come. This, however, does not eliminate the option to appear in any COMELEC office to register as a voter. After all, it was Professor Dr. Edna Ko who stated during the technical working group meeting held last October 27, 2020, that there is what is called the accession divide, where those in the urban areas have better access to technology than their rural counterparts. This therefore means that the manual mode or to go to COMELEC offices to apply for registration as a voter must always be an option. In a country like ours, where owning a smartphone or a laptop with internet connection is more of an exception rather than the rule, it is a challenge to go fully electronic. If you think about it, these gadgets may be considered a subtle property requirement in the exercise of the right suffrage. Another way to declog our system is to institutionalize early voting. The substitute bill on early voting for qualified um, seniors and persons with disabilities in national and local elections has been approved by the Committee on Suffrage and Electoral Reforms and was transmitted to the Committee on Appropriations for comments on September 8, 2020. In terms of ensuring access to polling precincts, the substitute bill on the amendments to the highly accessible polling place law, House Bill Number 6470, was approved on third reading on June 2nd, 2020, and was transmitted to the Senate on June 3rd, 2020. That being said, there are 16 bills covering the subject matters I mentioned, and these are prioritized as potentially so that it can potentially um, decompress the influx of people that will gather in COMELEC offices nationwide and in voting centers in 2020. I would like to report also to th that the committee devoted one committee hearing for the briefing of the COMELEC on their preparations for the 2022 national and local elections. COMELEC Commissioner Marlon Casquejo in that briefing held last September 8, 2020 categorically stated that they are ready to hold the May 9, 2022 national and local elections as scheduled amidst the pandemic. This despite the fact that the Department of Budget and Management approved only 10 billion pesos of their 23 billion peso budget proposal for 2021. The 13 billion pesos was intended for important items like um, lease of new machines, um, since only 6% of the voting, vote counting machines or VCMs used in the 2019 midterm elections is faulty and setting up the transmission of results in the purchase of ballot papers. But even with these limitations, I am positive that we will be able to hold our national and local elections as scheduled and no election scenario is simply not an option. The objective of the House of Representatives Committee on Suffrage and Electoral Reforms in the 18th Congress, and every Congress for that matter, is to increase the quality of the voting experience of the Philippine electorate, to make processes attendant to the entire election system more efficient, transparent, and accessible is at the crux of electoral reform. The focus is efficiency foremost, but now that we are facing this global health crisis, these bills can ensure the Filipinos can go through the application to be registered, a registered voter in a safe and physically distanced manner. We do not have a specific bill that addresses the health protocols necessary for, for bo voting in time of um, a pandemic. We do have a bill filed by Representative Onyx Crisologo institutionalizing online registration with a provision on health protocols that we included in the pool of bills that aims to amend our existing voters' registration law. 
the substitute bill which we approved at the committee level yesterday. The com Commission on Elections as a constitutional bod body must put in place all necessary steps and directives for our countrymen to exercise their sovereign right of suffrage under safe and healthy conditions. It is our, our position that implementing rules and regulations of each statute that passes the Philippine Congress, not only electoral reforms, must contain health protocols that must be put in place by the implementing agency considering the current situation. Thank you. Let us all stay safe and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Congresswoman uh, Ferrer. I think that was a very positive, very affirming, and very assuring uh, report from the House of Representatives, um, saying effectively that uh, the no election scenario is not at all an option as far as Philippine democracy 2022 election is concerned, and that our um, Congress people are working very hard to make uh, related uh, relevant uh, bills be further discussed to have a more inclusive rules and system of voting given our pandemic. Uh, please hang on, Congresswoman, for some of the questions that we may have uh, from, the, from, from the audience, from the floor. Thank you very much. Now okay. I'd like to call on uh, somebody else who has a very, very crucial role in the electoral exercise in ensuring that there is indeed an electoral democracy that will transpire in 2022. I'm referring to the electoral management body, the Philippine Commission on Elections. And uh, to represent the COMELEC, we have, uh, as I said, we have Director James Jimenez. Uh, Director James, you may have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm here to talk about the first Philippine elections of the pandemic era from the point of view of the Commission on Elections. Next slide, please. Let's get a few statistics out of the way first. In 2019, we had 61.8 million registered voters and a voter turnout of 75.9%. Back then, we conducted our elections in 86,769 polling places. Of course, things are different now. Now we have more than approximately 4 million potential new registrants, potentially 1 million reactivations, leading us to believe that we will have at least 62 million voters in 2022. We will have also an estimated more than 100,000 polling precincts in 2022. Next slide, please. So the question really before us is what are the COMELEX plans to ensure widespread voter participation while ensuring the safety of citizens in the national and local elections in 2022? Well, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. We are adopting a forefront strategy. We will redesign our processes we are implementing administrative solutions. Of course, we are relying heavily on the legislative solutions adverted to by uh, Congressman Ferrer, and we will be emphasizing public cooperation. Let me go through all of these one by one. First, in terms of process redesign, what a lot of people don't understand or are not appreciative of is that the elections are actually not a one-day event. Registrations start long before actual election day. And so what, what the picture you're seeing on the screen now is how it looks like in our registration centers. We have redesigned the process so that we are socially distant, so that we are uh, implementing basic safety protocols. We have also, to the extent that we are able, introduced online components to the otherwise fully present, fully physical or manual processes of voter registration. So we now encourage people to download their forms before they actually go to the COMELEC offices. We encourage them to set an appointment rather than wait in line for their turn at the biometric stations in the registration centers. All of this have combined uh, in the last 12 or 13 weeks to ensure 
that up to now, since September 1, we have not had a single case of COVID transmission at our registration centers. But this is just the start of the process redesign. Next slide, please. Obviously, we will be uh, Im imposing this no face mask and no face shield, no entry policies in all of our COMELEC offices and with regard to all election related activities moving forward. Next slide, please. The other thing that we need to redesign is election preparation. You are looking at the staging area for the preparation of the vote counting machines. Pre-COVID, these were not socially distanced workstations, but we have had to rearrange these workstations to ensure that we would have only one workstation per row. This has caused great uh, changes in the way we do things, not to mention the fact that it has, of course, run into some great expense. Next, please. Next slide, please. We will also be implementing administrative solutions. For instance, the filing of certificates of candidacy have long been understood to be a carnival atmosphere for everyone with people coming in and, and supporters coming in droves to support their candidates. We are looking right now at the possibility of making um, certificate of candidacy filing online or at least a significant portion of it doable online. This will prevent the crowds from forming at the COMELEC offices, securing the safety of both the candidates and their supporters, as well as the COMELEC and the media that will be covering these events. Next slide, please. Campaigning will also have to undergo a makeover. Uh, what you're seeing here is a common picture pre-COVID. This is how political campaigns look like in the Philippines. Obviously, this will have to change as this will be a super spreader event if it were allowed to happen in 2022. Next slide, please. The simple act of queuing to vote will also need to be redesigned and, and retooled because, well, it is dangerous to be standing in such close proximity to each other for extended periods of time. And uh, one of the challenges really of conducting elections, as was discussed earlier, is the spatial component. People are crowding into these places, which makes it very critical that despite efforts to decongest these polling places, those who do actually come to vote in that uh, particular place will still have to be protected in some way. So queuing to vote is just one of the many election day activities that will have to be redesigned by the COMELEC. Next slide, please. And finally, the polling places themselves will have to be rethought. One of the, one of the traditional um, aspects of elections that people are most familiar with is the fact that they are conducted in classrooms, classrooms in public schools nationwide. And these classrooms, as a general rule, are very small and cramped, making it very dangerous in terms of uh, keeping people socially distant from each other in terms of trying to keep the COVID transmissions down. So polling places are having to be redesigned. And in many cases, we are considering moving the polling places from these classrooms into wider, more open spaces, such as the covered gymnasiums of the schools. Next slide, please. And again, contrary to the expectation of many people, when we talk about the elections, we're not just talking about election day or even pre-election day. We're also talking about the post-election activities that happen, particularly canvas and proclamation. Remember that these are very well attended events, places where people are able to watch and, and, and participate in the ongoing canvas. So it's very critical that this be redesigned as well. Next slide, please. The third front in our strategy is of course, relying on legislative solutions. As mentioned earlier, we're looking at bills on online registration and amendments to certain existing election laws. We're, we're hoping 
that a postal voting solution is also in the works, as well as expanded absentee voting coverage. And of course, what everyone really wants is the ability to vote early. But these legislative solutions, as I said, are out of our hands, although we are very actively participating in the legislative process. Next slide, please. And finally, we will have to emphasize public cooperation. This cannot be done by the COMELEC alone, but the basics will have to be drilled into the minds of the voting public. They will have to be able to integrate these measures into their way of thinking. A apart from the voters themselves, we hope that public cooperation will also come in the form of the political players themselves, encouraging, we encourage self-policing and encouraging them to come to, to terms with this dilemma on their own as well. One of the problems of imposing new rules uh, for everyone is that we tend to have the, 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 the possibility of people just waiting to poke holes in the rules rather than participating or, or complying with them in good faith. So we hope the approach that emphasizes individual responsibility for the political players will make a dent in the way they think and in the way they approach this pandemic, because certainly this is not something that the COMELEC can do alone. We will be relying on extensive public cooperation, both from the voting public and from the political players to make sure that we get through all of this safely. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. As usual, Director Jimenez, uh, please hang yeah. on because uh, I already see uh, the first uh, question that was uh, written on the Q&A box and it looks like uh, it's something that uh, partly it's, it's addressed to uh, uh, Comelec. And now I'd like to call on our last but not the least of the four experts. He's a medical doctor, a former mayor of Irusin Sorsogon. I'm calling on Dr. Eddie Dorotan. Uh, he's also the uh, head of the executive director of the Galing Pook Foundation, local governance award giving body. Uh, Doc Ed, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Edna. Um, yes. I just want to share my presentation. Um, hmm. Hmm. Uh, can you see now? Yes, yes. You're good. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm um, a simple country doctor from Sorsogon. I'm now with uh, Galimpoak, and I'm also a convener of the COVID Action Network, which is a non-government actor that collaborates with both national and local government. At the same time, the NGOs, CSOs, the academe in combating uh, COVID-19. So what I'd like to share with you now is uh, how do we uh, conduct ourselves so that our election for 2022 will be safe and healthy, okay? Um, the first one is um, you should know the election 2022 activities and timeline. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Director Jimenez for outlining the activities and by also telling us that election is not only a one-day affair. In fact, it should be uh, uh, a long affair, no? so, which started actually last January of 2022 or 2020 uh, with the registration. 
Secondly, we need to understand COVID-19. Uh, we should know what we know and we should know what we don't know and try to project uh, what will happen now and 2021 up to 2022. The third is actually we don't wait for May 9 to set up our health measure. We apply it now. And that means ulit uh, ko to. You wear masks and face shield, wash hands, social distancing. And we also have to live with the COVID-19 with or without vaccine. Um, fortunately, we have the vaccine coming and therefore we need to talk about the vaccine but it's not the cure for all. It's actually the universal health care that we should pursue. That will matter a lot. Now, if you take a look at this um, time frame, um, Comelec said that registration started January 2020, but uh, this was uh, suspended because of COVID. Uh, so September 1, uh, restarted and this will go on up to September 30. So actually the task of the voter is to register. So I think online uh, registration is one of the best uh, method, but also hybrid face-to-face uh, -face will be best. Now on the right side, ano dapat ang health and safety protocols? Again, palagi natin na, na rinig to, wear masks and face shields, wash and and social distancing. But I would like to add that, this, that the two things. No? We need to live with the COVID-19. When you are in contact with positive, when you have symptoms, when you have a positive case, what do you do? Where do you go? Right? And since uh, vaccine is coming, uh, we should all be vaccinated. But when, how, etc. And how do we pursue so universal health care so that everybody uh, young and old, rich and poor, can be treated regardless of uh, religion, uh, status, and wealth. Okay, Yung vote, the next one is actually voter education. Um, at this point in time, I'd like also to share that even in this uh, time, uh, even Comelec should also share a lot of, uh, uh, as we learn issues of, uh, in election, we also would want them to learn about the health protocols uh, so that when the campaign period comes in and uh, voters uh, uh, would like to know the candidates uh, and there's a lot of campaign, there's, again, the health protocol should be uh, 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 followed no? until election time. So basically this is a thing that we should be doing. now. What do we know about COVID-19? Uh, so after 8.5 months of lockdown, as of November 24, we now have about 422,000 cases. And my educations are going down uh, per day. That in like 7,000 data tayo and now uh, mga 1,000 plus. And reproduction rate is less than one. As of November 9, that's at 0.85. That is good, no? But it's spreading also in other cities, no? Um, uh, Bacolod, uh, Ilagan, Lipa, uh, even Davao City, Grande Oro, Cambayo. Uh, to date, we also have uh, 8,185 deaths with a mortality rate of about 1.94. No? So actually uh, lower than the international average of about 2 plus no? percent. Um, this is the daily average daily uh, cases no so if you take a look at it we had a peak at uh, august and then it's going down at 1000 plus per case per, per day but mind you we'll have our christmas break so um, there's there's a possibility of a surge no and here are the top regions and the top cities now uh, death is also going down from uh, 30 per day in April, now like, like 60 tayo, now it's about 20, 30 and less than 20, uh, less than 20. So 
in a sense, uh, we're not yet out of the woods, but um, we're gaining grounds. And mainly because we have a very good testing capacities now from 300 lang per day. We're now into about 30 to 20,000 per day. And positivity rate is about average of 9.2%. But lately, this week, it's about 4 or 5%. No? Uh, this is important. Uh, who are infected? If you take a look at it, it, these are the voting population that are infected. No? From 18 to 20, it, the, the bulk, no? uh, the voting population. And uh, in terms of death, no? uh, as we all know, these are the 16 above uh, are more prone to death with COVID because of comorbidities. And most cases are mild and they recover. So uh, the nice thing about this COVID is that if you are mild, most 91 to 95% recover. No? Only about uh, less than 10% go to hospitals. So. And mind you, uh, there are about 7.8% asymptomatic. No? Okay, so what we know now is COVID is more contagious, but overall mortality is less, 1.9 in the Philippines. No? And it's uh, transmitted droplets, aerosol, airborne. Now, why, we, why do we have the 14-day rule? Because during that 14 days when you're uh, exposed and infected, that's a period of time you will have, uh, you will feel the symptom, symptoms. So. And typically the incubation about five days. No? And sometimes you get a swab and you're exposed and your day one, you will have negative uh, tests. No? So there's a lot also of uh, false positive and false negative, especially for the rapid antibody test. So, so we don't recommend the body the antibody test. So hopefully we'll be getting the, uh, the swab test that can be, uh, that we can get the results in 15 minutes, okay? Now, this is a very important why we have the mask because you know, it decreases the transmission by 85% the physical distancing by 80%, the facial by 70%. If you combine masks and facials, about 90%. Um, well, not but cure, but there are drugs that show positive effects on patients. No? Dexamethasone, remdesivir, convalescent plasma, and lately Regeneron, no? ginamit ni Trump. These are monoclonal antibodies na ginagamit uh, early on, mild cases. Ah, we also have the, the, the Chinese medicine, Lin Hua King Wen. Sa Chinese community natin, ginagamit talaga to. But mind you, dapat yung traditional Chinese medicine practitioner should do this. No? And even at the local level, we have the Lagundi and Virgin Coconut Oil, no? which has all clinical trials. In my case, I'm, for mild cases and close contacts, aside from 14-day quarantine, I recommend vitamin C, zinc sulfate, Lagundi. So uh, previous pandemics lasted 12 to 36 months. So without vaccine, COVID will be with us for some time. With vaccine, manageable. You know? Now, the, the good news is that vaccine is coming. You know? As of November 20, 54 vaccines are on clinical trials. 37 are in phase one. Ito yung mga safety trials. You know? 17 are phase two. So more uh, more trials, more uh, tests. But phase three, 13 are in phase three, ito yung pada effective ba o hindi yung uh, vaccine. And it will be around 1,000. Six are approved for emergency or limited use. But so far, zero pa rin approved for full use. No? And lately, we know that Pfizer vaccine uh, shows an effectivity of about 95%, Moderna, 94.5%, AstraZeneca, mga 7 to 9%. Uh, and sabi nila Sputnik, mga 92%. Uh, we don't know yet for the Chinese uh, Sinovac. Now, this is a projection. Uh. So USA, Fauci is projecting that uh, vaccine will be out this December. And if 
substantial proportion of residents are vaccinated by mid 2021, then some semblance of normalcy can occur end of 2021 to early 2022. May jo delay tayo sa Philippines, but sabi ni Galvez as of uh, today or yesterday, our best scenario is that we can have by second quarter of 2021 next year, makakuha na tayo ng 20 million doses of Astra vaccine. At uh, habi nila 5 pesos, 5 dollars uh, per dose. No? That's about 30% of total requirement. But the realistic scenario is that we will have the bulk of vaccine by end of 2021 to early 2022. So depending, no? so we'll be sourcing a lot of vaccine, not only from Astra, Sinovac, uh, Pfizer, and target natin is about 60 million Filipinos to be vaccinated. Why 60? Because with that number, magkakaroon tayo ng herd immunity. Uh, what we don't know is that uh, if vaccinated, ka, how long immunity mo? Two months, one year? Parang flu vaccine ba to? Na every year, meron kang shots. Cross immunity uh, among yung mga, mga, mga coronavirus. Pwede mga cor uh, reinfection like mayayari kay DILG Anyo. Uh, tanong pa natin long-term effects of COVID-19. Ito yung mga long holders. No? If you're infected, you can have uh, chronic uh, symptoms. Seasonality, pag rainy season ba or uh, mainit, mas uh, grabe. And kailan darating outbreaks. No? But the road, what is the road ahead? No? Again, our, our position is that if we can contain the COVID, the, the better for us that we can uh, hold the elections uh, very safety, no? but also open up the economy. No? Uh, if there are lessons we can gain from COVID, tatlo po nakita ko, is that national and local governments are inadequate in keeping us safe and healthy. Alam mo naman natin yung magkulang talaga. No? Hindi kaya ng national government. We need the participation of all. It also forces us to be smarter. No? We can be physically distanced but socially connected. And it should also make us to rethink how to rebuild better. In fact, also how to devise a better election. No? Uh, less uh, traditional, more uh, intimate, but also uh, corrupt free and also safe now. Uh, and therefore, what we need to do from now on is really to chart a new normal. No? Sa amin, tawag namin, magagaling na po. Let's uh, chart communities na safe and healthy, ligtas, smart, smarter na communities, matalino, and sustainable, no? matatag. Kahit mayroong bagyo, mayroong COVID again, etc. And ito yung mga importanteng gagawin na natin for us to have a safe and healthy communities. We should guarantee universal health care na bawat Pilipino, pag may sakit ka, uh, gagamutin ka. Di ba? Hindi lang yung hospital lang, hindi uh, outpatient. Pero na tayong law, but problem is we don't have, hindi pa natin na-implement. Uh, we should encourage a wellness and healthy lifestyle, community-based primary care, developing the health service delivery network, public-private partnerships, Diba? Clean water, sanitation, in-city affordable housing for the poor. In the age of pandemic, universal health care is not only a safety net, it is a matter of national security. Diba? So nakita natin, pang grabe, may hold lahat. Diba? So, important yan. And I've been hearing about a lot of uh, uh, internet-based uh, technology enabled sa communication, sa kwa natin, sa election. And Tama naman eh, dapat maging smarter tayo. Internet of Things, Artificial Intelligence, Blockchain, Mobile Application, Teleworking, tele, ito na, e-registration, e-voters education, e-campaigning, e-voting, etc. And uh, to be sustainable, kailangan tutukan din natin to ecology, water, energy, di ba? Waste, food, importante mobility during election time, di ba? Uh, Papano yung uh, transport natin, public transport, culture, livability, infrastructure, economy. Now, take a look at this uh, projection. No? 
Uh, from 2020 to 2021, tapos 2022. Dito tayo ang election, May 9, no? sa 2022. Now, if we have social distancing, if we uh, practice hygiene, hand washing, masks, etc., may restrictions sa travel pa, and we don't uh, gather, we don't, lalo Pasko, no? limit large gatherings. If we do that, then we can have gradual exit from lockdown. And therefore, cases will go down. But the problem is it, bag yung siguro Pasko, no? Uh, daming gathering, so tataas ulit siya. But with vaccine, kaya niyo to, with vaccine, no? Sa US, pwede na by, wala. By, actually, by uh, first week of, uh, first quarter of uh, 2021, pwede na yan. And if they can vaccinate uh, most of 60% of their population, pwede bumagsak ang cases, no? And we can have a normal for 2022. For the Philippines, I think, nandito pa lang tayo. So, uh, realistic really will be uh, third and fourth quarter of uh, uh, 2022 pa, or early 2022 pa. So that by election day, so mukhang hindi pa natin, tingin ko, hindi pa natin ma-vaccinate lahat. So, and therefore, kailangan uh, yung ating health protocols. Okay? And uh, in general, ito yung dapat i-gawin natin. No? So dapat we have a coordinated national plan and we have that IIT, et cetera. Uh, comprehensive system of testing, tracking, contact tracing, and treatment. No? Tapos targeted lockdowns when necessary. No? Uh, we should have a clear and organized advisory and precaution for polling staff, volunteers, voters, including those in self-quarantine and recuperating from COVID-19. Again, as I said, wear masks, face shield, wash hands, social distancing. We need to live with COVID-19. We should have a target of 70% national vaccination and universal health care. And I think uh, if we do this, uh, we'll in, we're on track in containing covid and we can safely hold elections. Mind you, in South Korea, April election, uh, may COVID sila, wala pang vaccine, uh, because of uh, health protocols na ginagawa nila. Uh, high turnout siya, 66%, walang COVID surge. Pero lately, may surge ngayon, no? after na election. Pero matagal na. No? Uh, sa USA, kabalik tara naman, no? high turnout nga, but malaking surge, no? grabe na sa Amerika. Mainly because uh, si Trump, di ba? Uh, ayaw niya ng mask. <laughs> anyway, so in summary, let me just say that uh, yung details for the health protocols can be laid out depending sa activities. But in general, again, itong tatlong uh, mask in terms of health measure we should do, no? One, wear mask and face shield, social distancing. And number two, we should live with COVID, meaning kung may nararamdaman ka, pa-check up ka agad. And pag may contact, uh, i-report ka agad. And so that uh, we could be tested, may contact tracing, and kung positive ka, mayroong treatment right away. And important is vaccine. So we should already plan the role of the vaccine this early, you know, and implement universal health care. So yun lang po, and um, thank you very much. Uh, magandang hapon po sa lahat. There you go. Thank you very much, Doc Eddie. Uh, we just had uh, COVID-19-101. Uh, we had a very good, uh, some uh, prescription free prescription from a medical doctor, some tips. But uh, in the end, it's about uh, the usual safety, health safety, and observance of protocols, uh, whether election or not, but especially to avoid the crowding and avoid social distance, uh, to observe social distancing. Uh, this combines with uh, having a smart, approaches to uh, uh, ensuring our safety, uh, especially or even uh, during the period of registration and election time. So thank you very much. Now we have had all the four speakers uh, pitched in. 
their own experiences, ideas, and suggestions. And there's a good number. There's a, there are some questions which are already raised from the audience. There are four questions in the Q&A box that we see. Uh, I will begin with probably uh, addressing some of these questions. Many of these are directed to the Commission on Election, to Director Jimenez but it doesn't prevent the other panelists, the other speakers to also contribute to the discourse, the discussion. So we have on the, in the, in the, in the board, in the, in the Q&A uh, box, question from Mr. Antonio Salazar. So uh, the experience of the US 2020 elections, he's interested if there are strategies and policies being developed by both the Legislative Committee of Congresswoman Ferrer and the uh, COMELEC uh, in trying to make sure that the public will trust the integrity of the elections. What we see right now is a rise of an infodemic along with the pandemic where there is growing distrust in institutions like the media and government institutions like COMELEC. Uh, we give the chance to Congresswoman Ferrer and uh, followed by uh, Director James, perhaps. Yes, um, Dr. Ko, um, to answer that question, actually, um, the Committee on Suffrage and Electoral Reforms can only tackle um, bills that have been filed by um, the representative. So the bills are, are filed and then it is they are referred to the committee. So we are limited to those um, bills that are referred to the committee. And right now, as I mentioned um, um, earlier, those are the three areas that have been filed um, in relation to um, online um, voting or registration or early voting. Um, there have, there are Two new bills that were referred just last week, a few days ago, on mail-in voting and um, smartphone voting. But this has just been recently referred. So this will have to be um, discussed or deliberated upon at the committee level. And then, of course, it will go to the plenary eventually if it is approved at the committee level. Um, so, um, so far in the House of Representatives, representatives, those are the uh, only the measures that we can tackle, those that are referred to the committee. Um, in the Senate, I, I cannot speak for them. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Ko. Uh, thank you very much. And that means that uh, uh, proposals will have to come forward before the legislators could address this. Yes, and, uh, that uh, is true. Yeah, subsequently there's a parallel or there is a subsequent session that should take place in the, in the Senate. Yes, that's correct. And then the combination, uh, the harmonization of these uh, two versions. So in other words, it will, it's, a, it's, a, it's a winding institutional process that has to take place and ideas will have to come forward uh, and be brought forward to the, to the House. I mean, ju just for the uh, uh, better appreciation of those who think that, uh, who think about the, the processes that our, our Congress observes. No? Uh, Director uh, James, would you have uh, anything to respond to the question? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. In, in fact, uh, the infodemic that, that uh, the gentleman mentioned isn't a novel occurrence. You know, it's, it's not happening just now. In fact, we pointed it out in the comment, like we pointed it out as early as 2013, when we said that uh, massive disinformation would be possible through the use of social media and social media networks, which is why in 2016, we started uh, in the absence of any law dealing with social media as, as, as an area of, of, of legislation, uh, we started with uh, administrative measures that would, we thought, help uh, keep the, the social media lanes uh, free of disinformation. Um, sad, sad to say that uh, our efforts have uh, so far 
not achieve the full success that we all want. And certainly in 2016 and, 29, and 2019, we saw how false and misleading information could be weaponized to undermine confidence in the electoral system. Uh, given that, we are committed to the idea of, of introducing uh, social media regulations to the extent that we are able. Again, uh, I cannot overemphasize the fact that there is no law dealing specifically with social media, especially in this context. So uh, we are doing what we can in terms of coordinating with the big social media platforms, um, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Google. Um, <coughs> they've been very good about coming forward and, and helping us um, within, within the scope of what we're able to do, um, actually try to contain this infodemic. Yeah, all right, Dr. thank Com, you. Dr. may I add? Uh, yes, please, <laughs> yes, Congresswoman. Um, yes. Comelec has been very active in the legislative process. So um, because we know that they have the expertise, so we always invite them to enlighten us when um, bills are being discussed in the committee. So um, whatever um, Director Jimenez uh, discussed earlier or mentioned earlier, those are all taken into consideration when we um, discuss and deliberate on bills. And they are always um, invited and they always participate in, uh, in the deliberations of the committee. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mr. Nunez. It, this is for Director Jimenez again. Uh, regarding redesigning the polling places, it looks like uh, it's good in the planning stage, but how do we ensure that this will be executed uh, as planned during the election day itself? Do you plan to hire personnel for Comelec or will you rely more on the Philippine National Police? Well, um, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Nunez. Um, in general, elections are conducted by uh, the boards of election inspectors. These are not COMELEC employees, just to be very clear about that. They're not organic to the COMELEC. They are, in effect, volunteers uh, performing election services. Now, the PNP is present uh, to make sure that uh, peace is maintained in those areas. Now, when we say redesigning the polling places, what we really mean is we want to swap out the small confined classrooms in favor of big open spaces, okay? So in general, the personnel complement will remain roughly the same. You will still have the three boards of election inspectors manning the table, okay? The difference is that people will be more spread out than usual. However, you are right. We will be requiring more people there to provide marshalling services for lack of a better term people who will make sure that, that the voters are, are socially distant, that the, that, the, that the voters are complying with the health protocols that we put in place. So yes, there will be some hires involved. Will we uh, look to the PNP? In, in Historically speaking, we look to the PNP or more specifically the PNP cadets, the PNP cadets uh, to help us with these marshalling duties. But as always, we want to make sure that the elections are very clearly civilian in character, and right. we would like to avoid the presence of, of armed personnel at our polling places as much as possible. Just as a matter of uh, fact, police are in fact required to stay 30 meters away from the polling place um, unless they are called to quell any sort of disturbance. And we expect that that standard will remain even during the pandemic. Thank you very much, Director Jimenez. Uh, that's uh, great to hear, uh, to say that the election is a very civilian activity and it has to assume a civilian character. Uh, the next question is again directed to Kamalek. I think uh, there's someone here from Indonesia uh asking this question 
Uh, Comelec seems to have already thought through what needs to be changed to ensure safety, including avoiding crowds. How does Comelec plan on enforcing the measures, thus ensuring the new rules are adhered to? Neighboring Indonesia has learned its lesson that many candidates are not compliant, especially since election contestants still rely on uh, conventional campaign methods that attract crowds. Director? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Uh, actually, Adi, um, I, I, I know the, the, the person asking the question personally. So um, yes, uh, in fact, that's one of the things that we are considering, the fact that political players waiting for rules to be handed down by the COMELEC, by the election management body, are waiting to poke holes in those rules waiting yeah. to find exceptions, waiting to find ways to go around these strictures, which is why we are adopting a different approach. Rather than just relying on rules that we ourselves put out, we are encouraging the uh, political parties and the political players to themselves uh, issue their own guidelines, their own social, uh, their own health protocols, so that the role of, of the election management body will be more of a coordinator rather than just a rule giver. Yes, obviously, we will be giving rules. We will be working with the IATF and the rest of the mechanism of government. But we believe that a major part of this effort will have to come at the initiative of the political players. This way, they have ownership of these rules and they will have it in their best interest to make sure that they are complied with. Very refreshing to hear. Thank you, uh, Director Jimenez. The next question is from Ricky. Uh, Ricky Javier, uh, Director Jimenez, what reforms can we expect to ensure clean, honest, and transparent elections in 2022? What steps are being taken to hasten registration of new voters which based on the experience of my grandson, took him two days. On the first day, he could not be accommodated because the cutoff number was 50 persons per day. On the second time, he arrived at 5.30 in the morning and finished at 4 p.m. I'm sure that many of the youth would leave and not bother to come back if that happened to them. What is being done to improve and encourage the youth to register. By the way, we have a large number of young voters or potential voters. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in fact, uh, the young voters account for one third of the voting population. And uh, in the coming, in, in this uh, registration cycle, we in fact uh, expect that we will have around 4 million uh, youth registrants. So that's a big number. Uh, if I may address the question of Mr. Javier, um, I understand uh, that, that the registration experience that you're describing is something that's very recent. The, the idea that there's a cutoff of 50 registrants per day is really because of the pressure of, um, of COVID measures being implemented in the COMELEC offices. As I showed you earlier, there's social distancing involved we are not allowed, we are not able to accommodate more people inside our registration centers because we are avoiding the congregation that happens uh, when we allow that, uh, when we allow people to come in uncontrolled. So yes, there, we, are, we are taking a hit in, in the sense that uh, we're, we're processing fewer people now because of the pandemic. And again, hopefully, by next year, we will be able to roll out things like satellite registrations, registrations in barangays, and this will help take off the pressure from our registration centers. Right now in NCR, for instance, we only have 34, 32, 34 registration sites, and, and we're handling uh, hundreds of thousands of people. So, I, I mean, uh, I would beg your indulgence uh, and, and your patience in, in dealing with these kinds of numbers. However, having said that, we, are, we have rolled out what we call iregistro.gov.ph. Uh, so go to the website, it's iregistro.gov.ph, and you'll be able to fill up your application form 
there. Okay, this will help cut down the time that people spend at the registration centers. Now, if you were to talk about registration as a process, about 90% of that process is really devoted to waiting in line, getting your form, filling it out. And the, the, the substantial portion of the registration, the biometrics portion, accounts for about five minutes. So you're in the, you're in the registration center for about 30, 45 minutes at the best of times. Uh, so you want to cut that down by taking the, the first process, the, the filling up of the forms and the waiting in line and, using, and doing it online. And you can do that with iregistro.gov. This makes it easier for the youth, especially to register because all they have to do is fill up the form and then go to the office for their biometrics. Again, the biometrics is a process that will take you all of five minutes. Thank you, Director Jimenez. I'd like to uh, raise a similar question and uh, direct it to Antonio Espinelli. Uh, in the Philippines, we have a big young population who will be voting in 2022. I wonder how uh, Antonio would describe experience in South Korea, for example, or in India, or in Nepal about young people's behavior and uh, probably uh, how uh, the process of registration and of voting in those countries uh, uh, can be described, particularly as this is encountered by young people. Antonio, would you like to say something on, on that? Is there a distinct behavior, a distinct process that needs to be considered or adjusted for young voters, for young uh, registrants? in uh, countries such as those that you are familiar with? Well, they are uh, certainly, uh, you know, first time voters, especially are a, are a group of uh, electors, um, traditionally at risk, uh, you know, not only they have never voted before, some of them may be disinterested. So I think the best way, you know, to reach this uh, segment uh, of the population that is uh, traditionally may be apathetic or put off by, by conditions like uh, an emergency, a crisis like a pandemic, would be to use uh, you know, uh, communication methods tailored to, to reach them in the most effective way. We have seen in South Korea that uh, you know, there were not, uh, I don't think there were uh, any special measures to, um, to uh, address, uh, to convince, uh, reassure the youth to participate in the elections. But more or less, I think, uh, for instance, like a broad um, uh, uh, effort also to instill uh, a sense of civi civic duty in the population uh, to come uh, together as a nation, regardless of your age or your uh, age group or social status, you know, has proven in, uh, in many countries, in several countries to be um, you know, to incentivize, uh, you know, the, uh, the step of voting, uh, the, the perception of voting as a, even as a cathartic in, in South Korea became also a cathartic uh, act to fight, uh, you know, the uh, limitations and the challenges imposed uh, to, on the electorate by the pandemic. So anything, you know, to use communicate, I would say to use, I would say, you know, the most obvious would be the use of social media, but also, you know, um, any other uh, communication ch uh, channel that could uh, uh, let um, young voters understand the importance of participating in elections, especially during a, a, an emergency or, or a national crisis like this. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, from Maria Vicenta Magpantay, uh, in the past, Comele conducted voter education nationwide prior to a pandemic, and which for the first time, voters and young people greatly benefited from. How is Comele implementing voter education in the time of pandemic? Well, uh, as, as a first response to the pandemic, uh, ma'am, we've rolled out uh, webinars. No? Uh, we, we've taken advantage of the of the teleconferencing tools that are available now. We also have a regular weekly webcast 
Uh, it's called Radio Comelec. You can see it on Comelec face on Facebook, Comelec PH, every Saturday, where we discuss voter education issues. Um, in in the coming months, we will be rolling out the webinars to schools as well. Uh, but again, it will mostly be or online. Um, of course, the reasons are, are obvious why we're going to do it that way. However, apart from that, we're also gearing up to uh, empower or, and to capacitate our field officials to conduct uh, actual face-to-face -face, uh, voter education seminars as we get closer to election day. We will also be leveraging radio, um, un unknown to many. We have, uh, we have what is known as Comelec Time, which is uh, the power granted by law for us to procure uh, broadcasting airtime. So we're going to be using that very heavily for radio in the provinces so that we can conduct our voter education uh, activities that way. Again, this is not the ideal setup. Obviously, uh, we, we used to go... We used to do hundreds of, of voter education seminars in person uh, on any given month uh, in the previous years. Uh, again, as early as last year, we were able to do that. But um, I guess you could say that we're still trying to get our sea legs here. Um, and, and the first thing that we're doing really is leveraging social media and the internet. Edna? Uh, yes, Doc Eddie, please. Yeah. Uh, can I comment on the role of the youth and also voter education? Um, since one third, um, James, since one third of the voting population will be youth, right? Yes, sir. And, and we, you will be having uh, something like 4 million new voters. Yes. Right? Uh, so they will be substantial, right? And at the end of the day, I think... Uh, what we learned from South Korea and even in the, in the USA, the youth was, were very much involved in digital organizing, digital uh, voters education, digital uh, mass movement for people to register. So that uh, I think uh, in this age of pandemic, the use of IT is very important, social media, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, etc., and the the young, right, the millennials, uh, uh, the new uh, generation that is uh, Generation Z, and we have also the Generation C, the young generation of my COVID. <laughs> I think that's one way that we can urge the youth, no, to be involved. Not necessarily from Comelec, but citizens group from uh, from different parties from. Uh, from advoc ad advocates for fair election. I think that's the way to go so that if we have a mass of young people mm. uh, chatting among each other, organizing among themselves and advocating for uh, honest, safe, and uh, transparent election, I think uh, this will be a change uh, uh, cha a, a change, a change uh, maker thing in our election for the coming 2022. In other words, it's engaging the youth themselves into, uh, into a part of the whole social design that they can be engaged in the whole process of uh, campaigning, of education, of information, uh, notwithstanding also the issues on safety and health but also making use of the technology which they love so much and which we in the Generation B <laughs> uh, probably are not into very much. Uh, and I think this is in the Philippines, young people is a big block in the, in the election. So it's important to get them in and to let them participate. I see, uh, thank you, Doc Ed. I support that uh, suggestion. Uh, I see someone I know, Telibert Laok, has a question. Would Comelec consider in the redesign challenge a time frame for casting the in-person vote on election day? For example, to redesign the in-person voting that would take a maximum of 20 minutes from entering the polling center 
to leaving the polling station? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, just to address the points that you, Dr. Ed, made, uh, you'll be happy to know that our voter education efforts are also on TikTok. If you know what TikTok is, then you're cool, you're hip, and, and that's what we're doing also. We're not as cool as that, but you know it's something that we're trying to do. Second, um, what, what uh, Telebert was saying uh, about redesigning the process to make sure that uh, people spend the, the minimum amount of time at the polling center uh, you know, as, as possible. Uh, one of the things that the COMELEC actually recently just completed yesterday was a time and motion study. Uh, we are actually uh, basically scenario building right now. We're, we're, we're trying to figure out how long it'll take for a regular person to register to vote. I'm sorry, to, to vote at the polling place. So we just recently, yesterday in fact, completed our uh, time and motion study on that. We did a time and motion study that um, assumed an automated system and assumed a hybrid election system, one where you vote and count uh, the votes manually. So um, certainly uh, we, are, we are still quite a way off from being able to prescribe a time limit or, or, um, or certainly a suggested duration of time during which voting will be allowed, but uh, certainly we're getting, we're, we're getting there, we're on the way there. Um, also relevant to that point is, I would like to point out that in the past, we've said that the COMELEC is considering conducting elections on more than one day. Uh, elections in the Philippines happen only on one day, but uh, deeper study into the issue has led us to believe that perhaps uh, holding elections on multiple days might be facing too many legal challenges to make it workable in, in the short time that we have. So COMELEC right now is really considering simply lengthening the election day. And this will fit right in with, with deliberate suggestion because when you lengthen the voting hours, when you, when you space people out, then you would achieve roughly the same result as decongesting uh, the polling places by having them vote on multiple days. So these are the things that are being considered. And yes, there will be economic uh, ramifications. There will be costs involved. And, and that's the reason why we're scenario building right now. And again, like I said, the first step, of course, is to conduct these time and motion studies. That's very I, good I, here. Thank you. Uh, yes, anyone who wants very, to- Very quickly. Yes, uh, yes, Antonio. I think you know these are very important points. Uh, it also, I would say, in addition to uh, um, redesign the, vo the voting system to make it uh, you know, more effective and to take place in a shorter time. It's also important to work on the other end, on the voters. And so what was very effective in, uh, in the Republic of Korea, in South Korea, was the uh, step that the National Election Commission took to create a code of conduct for voters. Right. Mm -hmm. So the code of conduct uh, you know, explained uh, the, pro the protocols to be followed the adopted measures by the NEC and the expected behaviors that for by the voters. This ensured that on election day, voters knew exactly what to do and yeah. what not to do, especially not to do in terms of uh, voting uh, procedures, but also in terms of behaviors uh, to, uh, to ensure safety. Mm -hmm. And so this helped re reducing the time they had to spend in, in the polling stations. It's also it was a risk mitigating factor because you know reduce also the risk of being infected. So there has to be some innovations, some creative ideas on how to go about the spacing out and uh, how to do the uh, in consideration also of behavior of voters and all that. Uh, the other the other thing that we have been hearing from you and from Director Jimenez is the. Uh, the uh, spatial, the physical design, which is quite important, right? And I think there's a challenge there for our architects to pitch in and say, how do you design a polling station that will be spaced out uh, so that it will suit the Filipino culture of, uh, you know, 
uh, being uh, very uh, sociable and uh, but they, they can't live in very cramped uh, places which is also conducive to uh, to contamination i will pick up on a very important question here uh, I would like, according to Ricky Javier, I would like to follow up on the question about reforms in our automated election system. We no longer want the problems we have had in the past elections, most especially the seven-hour glitch. I think this is uh, last year, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 2019 election, and was never adequately explained. There was a total silence. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, okay. Funny because uh, Seven Hour Glitch was in fact totally explained. An investigation was conducted by the PPCRV. It was explained before the Joint Congressional Oversight Committee on Automation. And it has been explained constantly since then. In fact, recently we conducted, we had a, a, an entire episode of Raja Komilek devoted to this Seven Hour Glitch. Uh, in, in, we invited everyone to ask questions. Um, of course, we don't expect that everyone who wants to hear about it would have heard about it, but to say that it was never explained adequately, well, maybe that might not be too fair. Having said that, the seven-hour glitch really was a case of overswing. If you remember back in 2016, what happened was one of the persons involved in the transparency server was able to enter an unauthorized correction into the system. It allowed the Enye character to display correctly. So it was cor the system was corrected and that allowed the Enye character to be displayed correctly. But in honesty, in all fairness, it was unauthorized. As a result of that event, the Comelec tightened the controls on the transparency server and made sure that even the simple act of opening the, the transparency server logs just the repository of data regarding uh, the operations of the system was locked down so that it could only be opened by a decision of the full unbank. Okay, that's seven people having to agree that this step was necessary. So the seven hours that we're talking about is really the result of that process working. working okay, it, 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 took, it took a little time to discover the problem to get the authorizations necessary to start solving the problem, and then finally to actually fix the problem. So that happened over a course of seven hours. Now, having said all of that, the question remains with, with most people, did the seven hour glitch actually cause any problems with the election results? It did not. Because remember, there are three tracks of information that are operating on election night. The first track goes to the canvassing system. This is the canvassing system that results in proclamations. Okay, This goes to the municipal canvassing station, to the provincial canvassing station, and to the national canvassing station. The second track goes to the central server, which is a backup of the first track. Again, the first track is the only track that results in proclamations. It is the canonical results of the elections. And then the third track, goes to the transparency server, which feeds the various media outlets so that they're able to come out with, wait for it, partial and unofficial results. Partial and unofficial results. Meaning to say, these results that you see on TV are not able to affect the ultimate outcome in any way because they are simply updating um, consolidations of precinct results. The actual official canvas happens on an entirely separate track. So what we lost that night for seven hours was simply the media output, okay? So the, the results never were in any sort of jeopardy. And in fact, one of the reason, one of the things that you can look at to see if, if, what, if, if what I'm telling you is the truth is if you go back during those very same hours, you will see that while the partial and unofficial results froze. In fact, reports were coming in of people being proclaimed. People were being proclaimed in the cities, in the municipalities, for local government officials. They were being proclaimed because 
the transmission was performing exactly as it should have. Okay, so again, just to emphasize and, and just so that everyone is disabused of this notion that the, that the seven hour glitch somehow affected the results, it did not because it was drawing from a data stream that was not connected with the actual official canvas and therefore could not have been the source of any official results. And number three, it only affected the reporting capability of partial and unofficial results. Having said all of that, the problem was that there was regulatory or, or administrative overswing. We were too careful. We, we, we lost the sort of flexibility necessary to respond to crises like this, but respond we did. And when, when, the, when PPCRV actually looked at the system, looked over what we did, they, they agreed together with all of the different experts from the different media representatives who were present there and who reported on this, that there was nothing amiss except for that one, which of, obviously they took us to task for. So yan po yung seven hour glitch, that's what happened uh, on election night um, in 2019. And will it happen again? Well, in any complex system, there's always the possibility of things going sideways. There's always the possibility of something going wrong. And siguro, the best guarantee that we can give you at this point is that the COMELEC will be better prepared to respond to that more quickly and, and uh, with, with lesser waiting time. Because ultimately, that's what the seven-hour glitch was, a long response time that should not have happened. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Director Jimenez. Uh, I'm about to wrap up in uh, uh, just very quickly now. But before I do that, I'd like to remind everyone to please respond to the survey that uh, the organizers of this webinar are uh, throwing at you and uh, please help us. As a way of summarizing things, I think uh, the election as a democratic exercise is showing to us uh, the diversity of experiences, even in other countries from where or from whom we can learn lessons in dealing with a pandemic such as a COVID-19. And there has been a systematic, a very uh, scientific documentation uh, done on this already showing the conditions, the measures, the behavior, the equipment, and how preparations can be done by the electoral management body, but not only that, by the collective experience of a country, if it, it really wants to uh, set the election really seriously with limits on openness, on transparency, on, uh, but ensuring integrity and inclusiveness in the whole process. Uh, we have much to learn as we continue to engage from experiences of other countries and international ideas role is to really see to us some windows from the global experience and perspective. At the same time, very crucial to Philippine elections is that many Filipinos look up very much to Congress, to the policymakers and to the election uh, management bodies such as the Commission on Election these are key players and things are moving in the direction of considering bills in the in the, in the uh, in congress to be able to respond to how we can adapt to the challenges of the covid-19 it's a bit slow because nothing is being discussed in the congress or in the house of representatives unless bills are filed and this is the nature of that chamber but it doesn't mean that it is not speeding up. In fact, we have witnessed how the hearings are going on and there is really dynamism and exchanges of ideas in this. Um, we have less than two years before the next election and the lawmakers have been working hard on this in conjunction with the, with the role of the Commission on Election. It is very pleasing to hear that COMELEC is opening up new ways of doing things due to the challenges and the limits that the pandemic posed to us. And therefore, we should continue this, uh, these efforts to innovate, to be creative, to open to changes, to have a combination of things being done. 
the good message of the medical doctor is to say, COVID-19 lang yan. Kaya yung gamutin. Basta we know what, uh, what we need to do under for safety and for health. But it is something that we can overcome because there are measures to address the health issue. But on top of it, what highlights, what, what's being highlighted by the, by the uh, expert is to say, uh, COMELEC alone or Congress alone do not define the rules on, on, and the practices and the behavior of the election. There is so much space for other players such as the citizens and the citizen and communities and young people do play an equally important role in a democratic exercise such as election. That's why we call it a democratic activity. It's not just the role of COMELEC, it's not just the role of Congress. It's not just the role of putting money. It's about putting our heads and be, becoming smart. But also, more importantly for the Philippines, there is a big challenge for us to see behavior of young people, to get them to participate, get in new players. Um, there was mention about political parties having to be mobilized in terms also of providing uh, guidelines among their colleagues, among their party mates, among their constituents to say, you are all equally responsible for the success of democracy in 2022. With that, I uh, would like to extend our gratitude, our thanks um, to the Commission on Election Director, James Jimenez, uh, Congresswoman Juliet Marie Ferrer had left us. She had uh, sent the message, but the, the staff are here. She's uh, on her way to attend the session in Congress now. Uh, of course, there's Antonio Spinelli. How can we not uh, bring him in? Uh, he comes from international idea, uh, the source of many learnings and lessons on electoral exercises. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Adi, and thank you to uh, international idea, my other, my other home base, so to speak. And of course, we have Doc Eddie, ang laging doktor ng bayan at ang laging nakatingin sa community, sa mamamayan at sa kagalingan ng lokal na pamahalaan. So all of us have many things to contribute to pitch in. As a way of concluding this as well, I'd like to hand over the microphone uh, just in time to close the session to the... Uh, uh, assistant or the deputy chief of party of this project on participate in the election. None other than Ms. Lorraine Dorotan. Uh, Lorraine? Thank you, Doc Edna. Thank you very much. Um, before we close our event today, we would like to say thank you to those who have joined us today, especially to our resource speakers for sharing their knowledge. Together with Dr. Edna Ko, um, we would like to present a certificate of appreciation to Mr. Antonio Spinelli, Representative Juliet Ferrer, Director James Jimenez, and Dr. Eddie Dorotan. Your presentations have given us even more confidence that the upcoming 2022 elections will allow us to participate in an important democratic exercise that will impact our country's future. So with the webinar, we've learned that with proactive coordination and partnership between the government agencies, such as the COMELEC, civil society organizations, medical professionals, and of course, we the citizens, we can work towards conducting a free, fair, and most of all, safe elections. As discussed by Mr. Spinelli, other countries have implemented innovative and sustainable solutions to ensure that elections continue as planned in the midst of a global pandemic. There are learnings from other countries that we can take forward as we prepare for our own elections. Congresswoman Ferrer also discussed several legislative measures that aim to preserve the health and safety of the citizens and the integrity of the ele electoral process. And Director James Jimenez's update on COMELEC plans and ongoing initiatives highlight the importance of a forward-looking approach in planning the upcoming elections. And finally, from a medical and public health perspective, Dr. Darotan shared practical health protocols to mitigate risks of COVID-19 virus transmission during the elections. 
with less than two years before our own elections, there is enough time for the country to continue turning plans into concrete actions. A balance of robust policies, strong health measures, access to information, and citizen participation will be key. The Ateneo School of Government, in partnership with organizations such as the National Citizens Movement for Free Elections, the De La Salle University, Ideals and Code NGO will be implementing a project which aims to increase political participation by the citizenry and civil society organizations. We look forward to working with you and having you in our events in the upcoming months. We would also like to request for the webinar attendees to complete a short survey and provide feedback on the webinar. We would like to thank you once again for your time and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and we wish everybody um, safety and good health. Thank you. Thank you. Are we done? Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, James. Bye, Ponyo. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Thank you.